I was, I was talking the other day to Linda Rising, and I mentioned that I'm a part of what I call the beautiful team. And what she told me was that, well, I'm pretty lucky because most of us don't, ex don't have that experience throughout the whole career even once. So we started talking what those beautiful teams are, um, what, are what constitutes an exceptional team. So what, what Linda mentioned was a book titled Beautiful Teams, which is basically a collection of stories from different people, some of them pretty well known, describing their experience with what they call beautiful teams. So there were stories about working on groundbreaking products. There were stories about uh, exceptionally difficult projects. There were stories about working in really complicated environments. The bit that I was missing, though, was actually something about teams, the team dynamics, how those teams gelled, what, how people interacted. It was all about we are working on this or we are working on, on that. And this is what this session is going to be. Uh, this is what this session is going to be about. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Pavel. I run Lunar Logic. Lunar Logic is a web software shop in Krakow, Poland. So if you like my story about teams, well, this is how we work. And uh, there are specific consequences for our clients. So if you would like to get a sense how it is to work with such a, such a team, well, you can always hire us. We are always looking for new interesting projects. Uh, I also run a blog, which you can find at brzezinski.com, and I would share that a lot of ideas around Lean Kanban, but also stuff like this one about building teams, about designing exceptional organizations. And you can also find me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is Pavel Brzezinski. So teams. Why teams? Why teams are so important? Uh, my answer to that would be asking you a question. So who right now is not a part of a team? And this is, this is why teams are important. Elise, you're the first one who is not on a team. Uh, yes, I'm between lines. <laughs> it will change soon. Um, teams are ubiquitous. We just take teams for granted. This is this, this atomic entity that is a part of every organization. When we think, however, what kind of advice we get about teams, we hear a lot of different methods. Uh, lean and agile. What kind of advice do we get about teams? Well, we would definitely hear something along the lines of seven plus or minus two people. We would hear something about cross-functional teams. We would hear something about collocated teams. Um, some of the methods would tell you that you should reinvent all the roles, etc. Others would tell you start with what you have. I do prefer latter. Um, some people would go with more kind of pseudo-psychological stuff like, well, Retzlan Myers-Briggs tests so to figure out personalities or something like that. And I don't buy that either. However, that's pretty much it. And it's mostly about how we organize teams. It's mostly how, what kind of structure we should provide for teams. And it doesn't really tell a lot about team dynamics. Now, when you look at different research around engagement, Lazar was using, using, using the word empowerment. I don't really like that word, but it would, it would translate to the same concept. concept. So when you look at research uh, on, on engagement, you would find that pretty much consistently, majority of the workforce is disengaged with work, sometimes actively disengaged, which translates to being actively harmful for the organizations they work for. It's not even not being helpful. It's being actively harmful. And when we're talking about engagement, well, one bit is motivation. And we are talk when we're talking about motivation, uh, we, should, we should look at this gentleman. This is Dan Pink. Uh, and he wrote a book, Drive, uh, about trying to find factors that are responsible for motivation, especially in the context of knowledge work. So what Dan Pink ended up with was there are three, there are three factors uh, responsible for high motivation. Autonomy, being able to make decisions about the work we are doing. Mastery, mm -hmm. being able to do our best, to become better every day. And purpose, knowing why we are here, what's the goal of the organization. So let me run a quick experiment with you. Everyone, please stand up. A little bit of physical exercise. I've heard this is good. Um, 
So please keep standing if you know exactly the purpose, the goal of your organization, what they are trying to achieve. If you don't know the goal or you're not sure, please sit down. And I, don't, I count making money as a wrong example of a purpose, <laughs> by the way. Okay, for those of you who are, who, are, who are standing, if you can do your best every day, and in fact, if you have an idea how to work better, you can, without any problems, you can do that every day. Keep standing. If you're not sure or you, don't, you cannot do it, please sit down. For those of you who are still standing, if you have all the autonomy, we already established that you know the purpose, you know what, are what you and your organization is trying to achieve, and you can do your best. So for those of you who are still standing, if you have all the power you need to make all the decisions regarding your work, to do your best and achieve that purpose, and you don't need to ask for permission, keep standing if you're not sure or uh, you can't, please sit down. Those few lucky uh, who are still st standing, thank you. Uh, you are the lucky ones. You, you, can, you can sit. Um, so, well, there would always be a few people who are really, really lucky. The message I get when I run that experiment consistently is really, really sad. It says, vast majority of us are working in an environment that don't enable engagement that don't enable high motivation. So why would we expect those people to, to achieve something exceptional? Why would we expect those, those teams to be, to be exceptional? So let me start with the purpose. Um, I am working in a business that is typically framed as a web software shop. We are building web projects for our clients. I don't think, though, that software development business is a good frame for our business. I mean, ultimately, if we were in software development business, the best measure of whether we are doing fine or not would be something like, I don't know, how many good quality lines of code we produce or how many features we deliver to our clients. I mean, these are metrics relevant to software development. I don't think that this is exactly what we are doing. What I, the frame I like is that we are in happiness business. We are delivering happiness to our clients. And we are delivering happiness to our clients because we are solving their problems. So the frames I use is either we are in a happiness business or, or problem solving business. And it just so happens that sometimes we solve those problems building software. But a typical, a typical situation is uh, when, I'm, when I'm talking to one of our potential clients, I advise them to send us less work than th that, that they want. Because I, my t t typical advice is, OK, to validate your business hypothesis, you don't need to build all those features. We can cut down half of them easily, or even two thirds of those, and you would still validate, or more likely invalidate, your business hypothesis. So it, we are not a software development business. If we were, we should be, we should be advising our clients to let us build more software. So this is one thing. We should know the purpose, why we are, why we are uh, here. The second thing is that uh, Dan, the, second, the second part of Dan Pink's list is autonomy and mastery. And in the context of knowledge work, those two are, are strongly connected. I mean, if we have autonomy, we most likely be able to pursue mastery as well. Well, given that we want to do that. Uh, now, if we're talking about autonomy, we need to think how power is distributed in our organizations. So how our organizations are, are structured? Typically, it's a hierarchy. So if I am a developer, I have a manager, that manager has a manager, and so on and so forth, up till the CEO. Now, what happens with power? Power is distributed to those management levels, and the more senior manager I am, the more power I have. And I use that power for a better or worse. So I use that power to, for the well-being of my team, well-being of myself, both or neither. But basically, I'm a king in my kingdom. And this is basically a dictatorship model. And if we are lucky, it's benevolent dictatorship. If we're not, well, it's not. So, so the power is basically assigned to people. 
And this is, this is interesting thing because uh, we humans are really bad are at giving up on power. So once we are given some power, we would be happy to execute that. So we have this dictatorship model and I want to focus on using power in the context of making decisions. Why? Because this is, in the context of knowledge work, this is what we use the power for to make decisions. We are not a sweatshop after all. I mean, hopefully we are not. So how decisions are made in, in, that, uh, in that kind of structure? Well, I'm a manager. I just make all the decisions I'm allowed to. And this dictatorship model is not that bad, in fact. Why? It addresses two very important issues regarding running business in ever-changing business environment. One is decisiveness. So, so given a clear distribution of power, we always know who should make and what kind of a decision, any kind of a decision. And the second pro challenge that, that we address with this model is accountability. So given that we know who is supposed to, to make a de decision and they make that decision, we also know who should be accountable for, kept up, uh, ac accountable for that. Now the problem with that model is though, we don't have autonomy across the board. In fact, it disables autonomy, it disables engagement, it disables empowerment. So we shouldn't be expecting that this model would work particularly well in the context of building exceptional teams. So what other options do we have? Well, one option that we have is something that we, the decision-making process that we would probably use when trying to decide on a three details with our friends which would be consensus-driven decision-making process. We would look for consensus. We would look for something that everyone would sign up to. And, well, it sounds well. I mean, ultimately, everyone participates in the decision-making process, so they get that autonomy. Since everyone opts in to the decision, they should feel, they should feel accountable for that decision. So, in theory, this model works really, really well. In practice, though, well, not so much. In fact, we tried to make, to make uh, decisions by consensus at Lunar for some time. So one challenge is that whenever a discussion starts, it tends to be dominated by those few alpha male types that you have on a team. By the way, uh, against common, common knowledge, men take typically 75% time of, of uh, discussion than women. So these are always alpha male types. Um, so the problem is that when those few people dominate a discussion, you don't pick the brains of everyone else. You don't get the, the ideas from the, from the whole group. So obviously you can address that problem with proper moderation, except you know, we don't have skilled moderators everywhere. So it's not, it's not that easy. The second problem is when, when you have a situation when there are two or more parties, each pulling toward a different direction and no one wants to give up. So discussion gets longer and longer and pe people get increasingly tired. And then they're like, oh, let, let just someone make that call. I don't care anymore, let's just move on. And on one hand, someone would ultimately make that decision and you would fool yourself that this decision was consensus driven. It wasn't. I just gave up. I don't feel accountable for that decision. And then it's extremely time consuming. If you try to agree on every decision you are making in a team, it would take long, long time to decide on anything. And one, one more thing that we realized when we were trying that at Lunar, was that it's not only time consuming, it, ex it is extremely emotionally taxing. So even discussions about stuff that wasn't that important sometimes ended up with tears and slamming doors and that kind of stuff. And I'll, I'll, up to the point where we, when we decided that we cannot do that anymore. So is that a third way? Well, we found inspiration in what some no management companies do. Um, and we call that, well, surprise, surprise, a decision-making process. So it looks like this. Within given constraints, and I will be back to constraints in, in a minute. Within given constraints, everyone can make any decision. There is one prerequisite, though. They are 
they have to consult two groups of people first. First group of people is people who have expertise on a topic. And the second group of people are people who will be uh, affected by a decision. So I can give you a few examples. Um, someone wants to go to that event, London Lean Kanban Day. London Lean Kanban Day. So who has the expertise? Well, Pavel was on three of those, so he probably knows something about that, so they should ask me. Then there is a financial expertise. So this event would cost something. There is, there is a cost uh, related to buying a ticket. There is a cost related to travel and accommodation. There is probably a cost related to not working on a project. So there is another type of expertise. So person who wants to be here at this event should ask these two groups of people. And the second, the, 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 second, the second group of people is people who would be affected. Well, who would be affected? Well, that person who wants to go for event, to, to an event. Another, uh, another decision, someone wants to organize a hackathon. Well, who has an expertise? Who took part in a, in a hackathon or organized one? Then again, there are, there are financial consequences. How much it, was co it would cost a, a team or a company not to work on projects for a day. And then obviously everyone who would be affected. So who would be affected? Well, obviously people taking part in Hackathon, but also a project team and a client would be affected. So they should be consulted as well. Now, the good part is that person, a person who makes a decision doesn't have to go with all the feedback that they received. In fact, if you are sure that you are making the right decision, you can go against the majority. But then you are accountable for that decision. Now, I mentioned constraints. So what kind of constraints we have? Well, constraints would be very contextual. So if we are talking about the context of teams, the power that we potentially can discuss is what the team can do, including team's manager. So it pretty much depends on how much power that manager is willing to give up. Well, give up, distribute to the team. And this is the important part because those constraints need to be very, very clear. Because the moment that the team, everyone in a team, thinks that they can make a decision and they, are, they go ahead, make that decision, and that decision is vetoed by a manager, the whole process is gone. I mean, we are back to square one and probably even worse than that. So this is why the constraints have to be very, very clear. And uh, by the way, at Lunar, we have only one constraint, that the financial consequences of a decision cannot be bigger than something. And that's all. So there is no, there is no constraints regarding to, you know, whether I do have expertise in that area or not. So for example, developers are deciding uh, on stuff like, oh, let's go for a ski trip with the whole company, or let's sponsor this local event. Now, one thing that is super important in that, in that model of making decisions is transparency. So there are decisions that an expert and the people affected would be me. I mean, I can buy a new mouse, computer mouse. I'm an expert in buying com computer mice. I mean, I bought a bunch of them uh, in my life and this would affect only me. And that's probably okay. But if I was buying a new mouse every other day, someone should ask me, well, Pavel, what are you doing with those mice? Are you eating them or something? So all those decisions need to be make, made transparent. So even if I'm making a decision that doesn't affect really anyone, I should make that transparent. And transparency goes even further than that because transparency uh, also means that I should have information, important information available that makes me make a better decision. So for example, if I want to make a decision about someone else's race, I should know the salaries. This is also something we do at Lunar. Um, so availability of information and, in, and, and transparency about decision made, because it's also a process that, it, that is, it is self-improving. As we see as people are making decisions, we learn to make those decisions better. So let me refer to Don Reinertsen, who, who is officially my no-management hero. I know that we know Don Reinertsen from a very different context, product development, product management, but what Don Reinertsen says about decentral decentralizing control is perfectly aligned with things that, that I'm talking about, about um, engagement in teams. 
about no management in organizations. So what Dom says is that there's two important bits for to, to succeed with decentralizing control is to provide information and authority to make to make decisions. So we we provide information with transparency and authority with decision making process. And by the way, a nice side effect of, of transparency of transparency that is pushed really, really far in an organization is that you build trust much, much more easily. Now, the biggest risk for, for, for that process is what managers would do. Because it all starts with managers on some level willing to change the way how they are making decisions, change the way how they are executing on their power. So they are basically giving up on, on making all the decisions and distribute that toward the team. And they, since typically in most or, or organizations, they still formally have that power, even if they don't execute on that, they can still ruin the whole, the whole effort. This is something that I mentioned before. And the reason is that, again, Don Reinerson, no management hero, um, the reason is that besides autonomy and information, we also need to let people learn how to make decisions. So Don, Reiner, Don Reinerson says that to, to enable lower levels to make decisions, we need to let them practice and occasionally fail. And it really, and I can tell you that for ma being a, formerly a manager, it feels really, really bad when a team goes against your advice and you feel like they're making a wrong decision and, and you're like, oh no, I know better, you shouldn't be doing that. And to let that go, it's super difficult, it feels bad, but it is the right thing to do. Because if you don't let people to fail, they would stop trying and the whole mechanism wouldn't work. And it results in in what I call participatory leadership. Leadership style that is very contextual, very emergent. So think of your teams, everyone without, besides Liz. Think of your teams. Who would be the best person on your team to lead the effort when you're solving a complex technical problem? Now, who would be the best person from your team to lead the effort when you have super tough conversation with, with a client. Who would be the best person on your team to lead the effort when you're addressing an underperformer on your team? Who would be the best person on your team to lead the effort when the mood is a little bit down for past week or so? Are we talking about the, the same person? We're talking about probably three or maybe four different people. Actually, I don't know a single person who would excel in all those four areas. A single one. And yet, this, the, the way we structure our organizations, the way we distribute power in our organizations, is simply saying that, well, we know who that person is, a manager. I mean, a manager has the power to make all the decisions re regarding all those problems. So when you enable autonomy, you basically enable all those people to start leading teams on different occasions. In very, it, it is very contextual and it basically ends up in a situation, I say that leadership is no, is no longer a problem because everyone is a leader. And it brings me obviously to organizational culture because it goes, uh, it basically describes what the culture of a team is. Now organizational culture is defined as a sum of behaviors of everyone in an organization. Not only behaviors themselves though, but also what drives those behaviors. Visions, norms, beliefs, principles. The tricky part about the organizational culture though is that we are talking about the whole organization. And so far we've been in the context of a team that is a part of bigger organization. Which means that when we start changing how the team works, we increasingly influence the culture of a team. Well, maybe not so much the culture of the whole organization. I see a problem here. We have a solution though, and this solution is called culture pocket or culture bubble. Um, so the idea of a culture pocket or, or a culture bubble is that we can maintain a very different culture 
within broader, broader culture, overarching culture of, culture of the whole organization. And one obvious example that comes to my mind is you know, all those uh, all organizations that have multiple offices all around the world. You would go to each of those offices and they would have a slightly different culture. I mean, geographically, culturally, they would be affected by people who work there. But we can achieve the same effect even when working at the same office. And again, we have good examples. Lean Startup. Um, Eric Ries started promoting Lean Startup as an idea to well run a startup, but also as a way to build products within corporations. So Lean Startup typically introduces a very different way of working. And some, some corporations are just letting some teams do, uh, build their products uh, uh, in a way that is des described by Lean Startup. And it results in a very different culture inside those teams. It results in a culture bubble or a culture pocket. Another such example is Skunk Works. So this is the idea from Boeing. And so Boeing occasionally starts a Skunk Works, which is a team that works on a project. And in, in case of Boeing, a project is basically designing and building a new aircraft. So it is quite a project. And Skunk Works work very independently from the rest of the organization. So again, it ends up being a culture bubble. And I also build a few culture bubbles in my career, and it's enough to have a manager who is willing to work in a different way and who is willing to translate that culture from a team and preserve the culture of a team and work with the, with the rest of the organization so that this, this communication happen. Because that culture bubble cannot work like totally independently of the whole organization, then there needs to be some, some communication in between. And this is why I typically say that culture goes over skills. And I have multiple stories about great engineers, frequently best technically skilled people on their teams, who were not performing very well because they didn't want to be a part of a specific culture. And in fact, it is not unusual to see someone whose net contributions to, the, to, to a team or to, to the whole organizations are negative, not because they are, they are bad engineers, bad developers, bad testers, bad graphic designers, but because they don't want to go with the culture. Because ultimately, it's a team, software development is a team sport. Not only software development, pretty much all the knowledge work is a team sport. So we shouldn't be looking at individual skills. We should be looking how teams work together. What's the team dynamics? What's the collaboration? We should be optimizing the way we build our teams toward collaboration. And when we were talking about collaboration, and let me go back to the purpose that I defined at, at the beginning. So when we were talking about collaboration and our purpose is solving complex problems, because this is how we make our clients happy. Well, we have nice research that is very relevant in that, cult, in that context. So for, for effectiveness in solving com com complex problems, uh, we can use research of Anita Wule on collective intelligence, because collective intelligence is basically a proxy measure to how good a group of people would be in terms of solving complex problems, accomplishing complex tasks. And interestingly enough, the traits that that research points as critical for high collective intelligence, so high skill in solving complex problems, would rather not be those that we are focusing when we are hiring people. Number one, empathy. Which organization tries to focus during hiring process on high empathy? Someone works on such an organization? I do. Uh, number two, evenness of communication, which doesn't mean how clearly I'm, I am able to express myself. It means that everyone in a group is taking part in a discussion. It's not about individual skills anymore. It's about how group collaborates. It's about team dynamics. It's a very different perspective of, uh, of looking at, at people. And finally, different cognitive styles. That basically, in our context, translates to bringing all sorts of different, of, of different people, and not only those with kind of engineering and analytical, analytical mindsets. 
When I look at how we hire, though, we are focusing on technical skills, we are focusing on people who are learning, who care about craftsmanship. If we're talking about communication, we would be talking about people who are able to express themselves well. We are looking for superheroes. We are looking for extremely intelligent individuals. And we don't pay much attention to how those individuals would act in, as, a, as a part of a group. And oh, by the way, when we are, when we are talking about research on collective intelligence, one of the outcomes was the more women on a team, the better collective intelligence. And it goes up till the point where a team is dominated by women. It's not about 50-50. We want to have teams dominated by women if we want to optimize for sol our teams for solving complex problems in a collaborative way. So this is what I call beautiful teams. Teams that have autonomy across the board. There is no power play because people who could do that cease to do that. Managers who are assigned power don't execute on, on, on that power. Teams that understand their culture, what the culture is, and they're looking for fit to that culture. And fit, cultural fit, not understood as working with people who are like us, because in, it ends up with very homogeneous culture, and it ends up with groupthink, uh, which, which means that we are acting for conformity. It's not really creative team. Cultural fit understood as we want to people to be the part of the, co the core of our, our culture, but at the same time to be as different as possible from everyone uh, in a group right now. And finally, the way we hire people. It's not about technical skills. It's not about hiring in intelligent individuals. It's about team dynamics. And those teams are not only beautiful, but also very, very effective. And if that sounds pretty radical, I have a thought experiment for you. There are organizations that apply those principles not on a team level, but for the whole organization, from the very top to the very bottom. Mm -hmm. And it works. And I know that because we are living that dream. Thank you very much. <laughs>